You are listening to MSP 1337. I'm your host, Chris Johnson, and I'd like to thank you for joining us today. Uh, First and foremost, I'd like to thank our sponsor, MSP Ignite. MSP Ignite offers a peer group experience that is unique to managed service providers in the technology industry. If you are serious about implementing a model for success through sharing and collaboration of best practices, this is the best way to do it. Head on over to msp-ignite.com to get more information. All right, on to the show. Welcome everybody to this episode of MSP 1337. I'm joined this week by Charles Love of Showtech Solutions. Welcome, Charles. Thanks, Chris. Appreciate it. I just want to say I felt pretty good about that. I didn't look at a note or anything and I was able to say your name and your company and I didn't stutter or say the wrong thing. I have in the past said other company names as if you work somewhere else. All right. Well, hey, so this week uh, we're pressed for time uh, as we get ready for the holidays. And I wanted to take a moment to talk about layers. It seems to be a very prominent topic uh, in, in the MSP Ignite space. You know, people are like, I want an easy button. You know, just tell me what to buy. Uh, I got this problem. I need to fill this gap in. And as I was uh, doing our advisory call today, one of the things that came to mind was kind of a rewind to the previous episode that you and I did where we talked about uh, you can only pick just one. Now, when we talk about layers, obviously, plural means that you have more than one. But what happens as these layers start to pile up and you start looking at are there products that are now an overlap? that I should remove because they're maybe causing me to see things that I shouldn't like false positives that are, you know, just really they're, they're butting heads. Right. Um, and we talked about this before the call, it's not uncommon for an EDR product to say, I don't like the fact that you have this third party antivirus product in there. Um, another example is like, if you look at like Huntress, if Huntress is deployed, you know, it really wants to see windows defender. So as we add layers, to our product offering or to the security services stack in our, in our organizations and with what we deploy to our clients, are we making sure that we're putting in a stack that plays well together, uh, that's complementary and possibly even to stuff that's already running in the client's environment, et cetera. So I, you're the first person that comes to mind when I think about you know stuff that's going into the client environment, just going back to when you and I worked together you were adamant that we have that stack dialed in, that there wasn't a guessing game of what's going to get deployed. So as we've kind of evolved from just talking about the managed services and, you know, make sure the RMM tool gets deployed and the AV, those kind of things, what are you seeing? I mean, we've had these conversations before you get three or four layers in, do you start to see it then? Or is it seven layers or do we even know? Like maybe you don't know, but that's the question. Yeah, that's, that's the hard one. And a lot of times these products are morphing. So when you, when you first evaluated, you know, product A to product B, you're like, sure. oh my God, product A does so much more. Right. And then six months later, product B has acquired 17 other companies. <laughs> right. And, and now is a totally different animal than it was six months ago. So right. You- so you just threw a wrench in my whole idea with layers. And so I'm going to, I'm going to throw it back at you because of what you just said. Now you're basically saying that on a regular basis with probably at least a monthly consistency, I'd be willing to compromise and say, or yeah, compromise and say quarterly reevaluating what is the product that I'm buying from vendor, whoever it is, and has the product or the service offering from that vendor changed in such a way good, bad, or otherwise that I need to reevaluate this being part of that layered stack. Yeah. And, and in the past, in my experience, the Thanksgiving to New Year's timeframe has always, I don't want to say been dead, but it's, we're not banging projects out. We're not closing deals, things like that. That has always been a good time for us or for me specifically to really take a moment and analyze everything. Sure. Right. If, if I'm, you know, I don't want to say this, but if I'm looking at vendor technologies, it's going to be in that time frame. Right? And, and as it probably should be, because 
when Correct. you do buy new products from most vendors, they don't want you don't want to get into that hole. And and this vendor uh, co terms with this vendor, but my other nine yeah. vendors they don't, and they're scattered between January and December for terming on a product. And so now you're you're chasing contracts and it gets messy, especially if it's like there's only one client left on this. Oh shoot, we missed the term date. Yeah, and. The last two years, uh, COVID included, I have found myself reanalyzing certain vendor technologies around the summertime. So it's it's kind of evolving into a two year cycle now. Sure. Where I'm I'm really looking at stuff in the December time frame, but I'm having to reevaluate in the July, the June July time frame, just because things change, people get bought, technologies swap. You know what I mean? They don't do what they used to do anymore. Well, and I think so that that's actually a better example. So you're basically saying twice a year, I'd feel more comfortable saying twice a year. I may have been aggressive with monthly quarterly, but twice a year would probably be relatively reasonable because we can, we can pallet six months left on a contract, but saying I got a whole nother year left and I'm not happy. That's, that's not a good spot to be in. Correct. And, and the time to, let's say you are going to make a wholesale change, right? Sure. Um, the, we used to work for a company who called it the vendor Olympics. Um, uh, you want it to be at least a lap around the track, yeah, not, not exactly. a 15 major sprint. Got it. Well, but you want to do those Olympics, um, where it makes sense, but the time to analyze if you're going to keep a vendor is not the month it's due <laughs> because like, that's if, called if, the knee jerk reaction. Yeah, you're, you're going to just make a, a stupid decision. You're not going to have time to vet it. You're not going to even have time to talk to your team. You're like, I have to sign this contract. I've been pushing it off. I either renew it for a year or I cancel it today. And chances are you're going to renew it, even if you don't want it. Yeah, right? and, I, and I've been in the, the position where you, you had, say, feasibly picked a new product. You were a little late in the, in the game. So you've done maybe a pilot. You've even maybe committed to a purchase you know, beyond, beyond that, whatever pilot window is, and then realize that it's still a pretty big lift to move what you have existing to the new environment or to the new, yep. you know, not every vendor has a good transition path, right? Like I, I was, uh, I, I can't remember who the vendor was, but they, one of the service offerings that they have was tied to EDR migration. I was like, wow, we're, we're already that far along in the progression of the EDR space that there's now vendors that do like there is for 365 tenant migrations. It's like, wow, this is a thing. Yeah. And, and what I do and what I've always told people to do, funny enough, it goes back to what I said at IT Nation, what feels like a thousand years ago, um, which is 121 days. In my opinion, that's the magic number. 121. So I would set a reminder in ConnectWise world, I would create a config for that vendor warranty or that vendor renewal. And it would alert me 121 days so that I have about two weeks to, to push it off because I'm too busy. But then I really got to work on it. Well, um, you're not buying yourself a lot of time with 120 days because I was trying to do the math in my head and I'm a little slower, but that's, that's four months to like the Band-Aid is coming off at the end of that right? Like the switch yes. is done at four months. So if you're evaluating in month one, you want to be well on your way to making a decision to move off before you hit the end of month three, because now you only Correct. have about 30 days left to get like moved. Yeah. And, and it really depends on the stack, right? If, if I'm sure. making a determination, if I'm keeping, you know, whatever vendor and it's an easy play, then, then that's probably fine because a lot of times there's a 30, 60, 90 heads up if I'm going to make a change, right? Um, but uh, maybe on something bigger, if God forbid I'm looking at an RMM or a PSA swap. Yeah, there, there's probably a 400 day lead time on that one. So let's talk about that for a second because I actually that's what jumped into my head was, and, and we, we know uh, many a colleague that has had a, I can't believe my sales rep or account manager did X. We're off that we, I just pulled the plug right now. We're moving to fill in the oh blank, God. right? Yeah. Like, oh, this, this, this vendor wronged me this one time. So I'm pulling my stuff. You know what? Right. If you I haven't been wronged back. by your favorite vendor at least once, I'm not sure you're actually engaged with the vendor. 
we all do it. Your right. employees do it. Like it's dude, it, know your stack, know what it is, right? It, it one may be prettier because they invested more in the UI, but man, you can you can be a master at the ugliest system in the whole wide world and still be better at it than somebody who has the prettiest system with only two weeks experience. Well, right. I mean, I've, I've been evaluating my own re- tools and to, to solve some problems for me. And I jumped in both feet, you know, feet, I, I did do feet first, not head first. Otherwise I really would have cracked my head wide open because <laughs> I discovered I was not in the pool. Um, I hadn't got that far yet. I was still, you know, in the lawn chair trying to get out the, the, the lounger. And what I uncovered is, is as sophisticated and, and smooth and easy to use the product actually was, I hadn't really considered how it would change my workflow to use the new tool. And I'm like, so I, I get in there and I, and I built out my retainers and I, and I built out the, the recurring tasks and, the, and a few other things. And, and then I realized like that doesn't work for me. And I had to start over. And then I did yeah. it for a sec- I did it a second time and started over. Had I been in an existing system prior to that, moving into the new one, I, I wasted 90 days or 60 days, whatever it ended up being. And I finally have a workflow and I'm happy with it. But I mean, to, to rip products out, and I know we kind of deviated from like the layering piece, but maybe this is a good example. If you think about what are the layers of security services in your stack, how are they impacted by those other back-end business systems if you do take one of those out or you put a new one in? What happens there, right? Do you remember? I remember you and I having this conversation oh so many years ago, a thousand years, I think it was, um, where we were talking about if it doesn't integrate with my PSA, mm-hmm. the list was like a mile long that had to be convincing as to why we would even consider it. And I remember that that knocked a lot of vendors off the, the, the list real quick. And I remember one of them being like, when we would get told that they integrated with our PSA and you dig and you're like, wait, that's just email. Yeah. Or, or it's like, it, or, or it pulls data. It doesn't like it's, it's syncing data. Like it's copying and pasting from one to the other. It's not an actual data flow, man. Those were killers. So let me give you a real world example because it really goes down to the stack. I was looking at uh, uh, you know, stacks uh, a couple months ago and one of the technologies I use, I, I actually had two products that at the time were not competing, right? Oh, sure. And, and as I do my, all right, let's go through my lists. I have my pro list. I have my con list. It's kind of goofy. I have, I buy those big giant uh I mean, I have a whiteboard, but I don't use it. I use the uh, the big post-it notes, right? Yeah, the ones you can, walls. and they have the adhesive, and you go and stick it on another wall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I look like a serial killer with all these notes all around. Uh, that's not good. <laughs> yeah. Hey, everybody but, listening, uh, just don't 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 hear that. Yeah. He also lives um, in Florida. Yeah, that's a different thing. <laughs> but uh, uh, I had come to find out that that one of my technologies that I figured was in my top five on the stack. Uh, not only had turned from a yearly contract to a three-year contract, but the things I liked about it, they actually shut it off, right? They were sunsetting. Oh. And this other vendor, which is only a month-to-month contract, right, had actually turned those things on. So I was able to really make an informed decision of, wow, I actually use both these tools. And in this scenario, I didn't necessarily realize that they both did the same thing now. So by, by just sitting down and looking and just asking the rep, hey, can you re-onboard me? Right? Because there's all these, what, you didn't know we supported something, something that only came out two months ago? I had no right. idea. Right. right? So sometimes even just asking for that re-onboarding or just say, hey, just pretend I'm new. Um, you're like, I did not know it did that. Yeah, you I know? have. I have a vendor that was in the, that's kind of that, like I knew it was kind of like Coke, the product versus Coke, the brand. So like mm-hmm. I'm using Coke, not realizing they're this huge conglomerate of, of sodas. Right. So I've been using this vendor or the product with this vendor for we're going on year four. And I just happened to go to their public facing website and it redirected me. It had never done that before. And I'm literally on the new site and I'm like, Oh my word. Like these are all things that I get included with what I'm paying for. Like they weren't, 
they weren't like, oh, by the way, up your contract to buy more products. It's like, as a part of our new synergy, these are the things that you now have access to. And I'm like, how long has this been going? So like, like you said, I reached out to my rep and he's like, oh yeah. He's like, that happened uh, about 18 months ago. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, like I'm the king of unsubscribing, right? So if I sign up for a product, the first email I get, nope, sorry, sorry, vendor friends. Uh, I've, I've unsubscribed. So I, I don't always necessarily know, yeah. uh, you know, that new things are out. So that's why it's so important to, to really have a plan to look at what you're going to, you know, either auto renew, evergreen, whatever. Right. But y- you have to know what you have and what those things do. Well, I mean, this is funny enough. This is like literally step one, step two, controls one and two in CIS are uh, authorized hardware inventory and authorized software inventory. Like yep. it, inventory is, is, is a little bit, um, I'm going to just say 10,000 or 20,000 foot level because that's like, I have Microsoft windows. Okay. That, that's maybe even too specific. Okay. Well, what versions of windows do you have? And are they supported and, and, and right. Like, because yeah. just saying that I have my assets and they're authorized. Well, what about them could possibly be detrimental tomorrow if you're not constantly checking on it today? For sure. And I, again, I want to make a clarification here. I wasn't trying to say that vendor screwed up, not telling me it was more like I didn't do a good job of looking at what my vendors are providing us to make better decisions around, you know, the layers of the stack. Um, so, so let's shift gears for, for what time we have left. And let's talk about when we think about layers, you know, the onions of the onion of security, can you have too many layers? Absolutely. You can overcomplicate things, right? The, the, the more security software you run on a machine, Right. Obviously, you know, everybody's going to need a nine, nine at that point. You know what I mean? Is that like saying, um, no, really, it's a really light agent. And you're like, but I have 25 really light agents. (laughs) Yeah. 25 really light agents are, uh, you know, bad, but you know, that's what they all say. And and that's what happens. So you really got to come to the determination of what your, what your stack may be. Now in, in some scenarios, your stack may be tweaked a bit. Sure. Right. So customer to customer, it's probably going to be more like customer type. Mm-hmm. Right. So for example, we, we do a lot in education. Um, I just spam filters. This is mm-hmm. the easiest one to explain. In Microsoft land, students are free. Faculty is like fee, you know, it's like not pennies. Yeah, it's it stupid. Is, it is. Yeah. But you go to any other spam vendor on the planet and they're like, a mailbox is a mailbox. Oh, right. you have 30 mailboxes? Then let me get my calculator out. Do, 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 do. It's going to be $6,000 a month for spam protection. I want my calculator to sound like that. Yeah. But it's, but, it, but in certain scenarios, like for education, my go-to spam product, I can't use. It's priced out the wazoo, right? So I have to go to my education one. Um, but that's a, I wouldn't necessarily put the spam protection I put on education clients on like a commercial client. You know what I mean? But, but still that's my education vertical stack. It's different than my corporate nonprofit. So I think that's different a little bit than what I'm saying. I agree with you. I mean, you're, you're talking about like firewall a for client type X versus firewall B for the other client type. Right. I'm thinking more along the lines of the, maybe this is maybe a better way to say this is tied to I have stuff that runs on the endpoint. So you don't want 25 light agents or even one heavy agent, right? Those are the, they kind of go, those Correct. are the same. We don't want either one of those. Um, and I remember like Sophos and some of these other vendors that started to take their, their AV product and they started moving parts of it to the cloud more and more went somewhere else. It wasn't living on the host anymore. So I, I, I would ask the question this way, and maybe this makes it easier. You described one that made me think of it this way is, you know, a spam filter is not, on my endpoint, at least not likely on my endpoint. It might even be sitting somewhere in front of like 365, right? Before it even hits my Mm -hmm. cloud mail, before it ever comes to whatever's on my endpoint. Talk to me about how you approach layers in that perspective, because you have like more of like the business and infrastructure layers. Like I'll, I'll use this loosely because not everybody has an office anymore, but like we'll say old school. 
I've got a firewall and we all sit behind that when we're in the office, which is something that sits over there, right? Versus on my computer, I have my EDR or AV or whatever it is. Those are two different layered stacks that need to work hand in hand, but it's almost like three parts to an evaluation, right? There's the organizational evaluation of security layers at the perimeter or, or understanding what those perimeters are. There's the security stack that sits on the end user's endpoint. And then there's kind of that hybrid of how they, how they create synergy with each other. Cause that would be crazy if you had them conflicting with each other, right? Like for sure the end user's perimeter moved and you're still blocking them from everything because it's a different firewall. Correct. Yes. It's, it's, it's like the people who renew their, you know, gateway antivirus when they close their office. Right. 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 You know, I've seen scenarios um, recently where (laughs) we are waiting to send a tech on site to Madrid, Spain for the four users that used to work out of that office. No one is currently working in that office, but they're adamant that we get that firewall put back in there. Are they ever going to go back to that office? No, probably not, but we'll, we'll get it secured. Yeah, for sure. But, but yeah, it's just, you got to know what you have and and just keep, keep up as best you can to see where there's overlap, man. Cause if I can consolidate bills and I could drop a few vendors because I'm doing too much, I'm all about it. So where does the ownership of that lie? Because I was talking about this with regards to like vulnerability scanning and vulnerability management, which is an upcoming town hall that we have. And, and, it, and it turned into like, um, we broke it down to like four different categories. You've got vulnerability scanning, which everybody needs to do, but then you've got vulnerability awareness, you know, who's, who's sort of running point on like being aware of the vulnerabilities that are impacting your organization based on what the vulnerability scanning is doing. And then it got into, okay, well, who's responsible for managing all of that? And then the last one was like, who's responsible for orchestrating the remediation of that? So I just went down a rabbit hole on a completely different topic, but like to what you're talking about now is like, who takes ownership of that? And is it one person? Is it, is it multiple people? Uh, is it a peer group thing where you're like, you go to your peers and you're like, Hey guys, these are the vendor products that I'm using. And I'm concerned about A, B, and D, not because they don't work well in my environment, but I'm not sure I'm getting my, uh, the value on things that I didn't know that they have, or all of a sudden there's overlap and you're not sure if I need to make a decision to keep them where they, you know, keep them in their silos or start taking advantage of the features that have now been incorporated because they've added new things or bought some other vendor. For sure. And, and it's, it's kind of a double answer. Uh, answer number one is going to be whoever's rear end is on the line. If it goes South, right. (laughs) They, it's like, it's well, not going to be my tax. In our case, it's going to be me. So I, I'm ultimately going to have say here. But you bring up a good point. Any major decision that I have, I do bring it before a peer group. Right? Just because yeah. I want to make sure the other seven or eight people on that call aren't going, you are crazy. What are you doing? Right? There may be a couple like, oh, yeah, that vendor wronged me one time 12 years ago. And I... I take that with a grain of salt that the employees are going to say the same thing. Right. Yeah. Um, but you, you just have to be able to have your brain trust bounce things off them. Even if they're negative about it, you know, what's right for you. Make, make an informed decision that way. Do you think with that in mind that you would take it also in front of your text too? So like I think about decisions that I've been a part of less well, even, even in both sides, like being a part of like, this has been enforced or, or implemented and put on my plate to follow along with, this is the new tool of choice versus I'm the one that's made the decision to go with this new tool. Sometimes you can, sometimes you can't, right? Right, because uh, the I, resistance can be high enough that you're like, oh, oh my that, God. Wasn't, that wasn't a good idea. So it's, it's like the, the one tech who's a fan of one antivirus and you rip it out. From, from that point forward, every time the lights flicker, uh, it's that antivirus, you know, it's probably what it is. No, right. how, about, how about you troubleshoot it, right? That's a rare scenario. But, but, but it's a good example to say that it's some, it could be that simple. Hopefully, hopefully, the sophistication of your engineers is not limited to how being an expert on one AV product. But. I, for, for sure. But, but yet they, they, they should be part of the conversation. Again, right. that's part of that brain trust. Right. It, it, it depends. Is it something that they're going to live and die by? Right. right. Like I wouldn't dare 
change a remote tool without talking to them, right? Uh, security suite where it's all back end, you know, magic stuff. That's that's different. Hopefully that makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. So um, with that, I think we can wrap this up and basically say, uh, if you've got too many layers, call Charles. No, um, exactly. <laughs> yeah, it call Charles. And and more importantly, is know what the layers are is a far more important than how many layers you have. And with that, exactly. with that. This is an episode of MSP 1337. Have a great week. Thanks, guys.